All right, everybody, welcome, welcome here to show 138 today. Joined here with our special guest, Stefan Kinsella. That's the second time Stefan's been on the show. Uh, very, very, I think, well-read and well-spoken uh, educator uh, on the subject of liberty, uh, lawyer, and also an expert in IP and uh, the promise of, uh, of liberty if we, if we would abolish IP uh, in the world. So a lot of interesting things I'm always interested uh, to hear his take. Um, but today we're going to talk primarily on the, on the Ukraine war, which has been raging, you know, for almost nine months. So a lot of uh, things to talk about with him. Stefan, thanks a lot for joining and uh, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Good to have you on. This war is very divisive, I think, among uh, classical liberals, libertarians, you know, whether you live in Europe or uh, you're a libertarian in the US, you might fall on one side of the uh, of this debate kind of kind of uh, automatically it seems you know i've noticed you on twitter over the many months going back to february march kind of pushing back against that uh sort of us is always wrong libertarians are so disillusioned with the us empire it's obviously the us's fault that ukraine is invaded this type of narrative still goes on today but it was really really strong in march April, I noticed, uh, to me, you were standing out there in the, in the Twitter space, at least, pushing back against this. Any reason in particular why you sort of support the freedom of Ukraine and supporting Ukraine against the Russian invasion? I've always had a contrarian streak. Like, I'm, I'm put it this way, I'm willing to say something um, despite the, the peer pressure of other libertarians. And if they start, if they start going one direction. I'm going to, if I have a different opinion, I'm going to say it, even though they're going to give me shit about it. You know, um, I mean, look, I've always been a, a an anti commie. I, I hate communism. I hate Russia. I think it's horrible. I don't. I don't like their culture. I don't like their anything about that whole um, part of the world. Um, yeah. I have no illusions about, you know, uh, this Reagan-esque view of America and all this stuff. However, you know, I I, um, I guess – and plus I think it's partly because of my interest in international law, which I also gave a talk at it, the HAPA conference a couple of years ago. And I got a little flack from that too because you have this kind of um, instinctual reaction of libertarians like – they're almost like John Bircher's, you know, like uh, the UN is like the worst thing in the world and all this. But to my mind, yeah. the UN is like one of the least bad things out there because the United Nations has very little power. It doesn't really have the power to tax. And its primary function is a, a meeting place for the great powers to meet and the countries and the nation states to meet and to solve disputes uh, by conversation and discussion rather than war. So – even though it's not perfect, it's like better than the alternative. And the idea of international law also is something that attracts me because it's like international law, because it's not legislated really by a super sovereign, um, it sort of conforms more to the natural law idea of, of you know, coming up with good arguments for, for sort of natural law type norms. So I've always uh, – I mean I know that they're socialist uh, – twist to it and the, you know the the De universal declaration of human rights and all this socialist stuff um but overall yeah. i think it's it's something that appeals to me and so i'm also anti war <laughs> and so i think that one way to oppose war is to have international law respected and inter international law means number one you 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 live up to your agreements and Russia did agree to Ukraine's borders after the fall of uh, the USSR in 1991, right? So yeah. that's one thing. And the other is just international sovereignty. Not that I'm a, I believe in states' rights, but I do think that if every state is seen as having a right, which and and that means that other states don't have the right under international law to invade them for no reason, um, then we would we could reduce war. So what I think I think so what the commies have done what the, what the Russians have done is clearly illegal under international law. They're clearly brutalist thugs, and all this all this nonsense about oh the Ukrainians are uh, who cares about the Ukrainians and they're they're neo Nazis. It just seems like bullshit to me. Um, and and so on the other hand, I also personally don't think that 
the West and the U.S. and NATO should be involved in all this. My personal view is we should not be. But but I, I also don't – like like say Hans Heimer Hoppe gave a good talk, um, uh, uh, an impassioned set of talks at, at uh, the PFS this year, which are on our website now. Um, about Ukraine and all this. Now, Hans's position. So you mentioned you're in Europe and you have this more Lithuanian, this more Eastern European uh, approach to it, more than yeah. the American libertarians. But there are some, there are some like German type libertarians. I think that are like jealous or or they're or they're or they're 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 angry about the um, the the domination of their country by. The U.S. through NATO yeah. and through the aftermath of World War II, and so yeah. that's what their focus is. So I listen to Hans's talk with interest because I don't quite agree with him on everything. I, I mean, I agree with his basically his idea of a big sweep. Like you have to have a big a big picture here. Um, I don't agree that NATO is an aggressor. Um, I think that if you have a, a voluntary defensive union and other countries want to join it. You know, they're sovereign countries. They have the right to do whatever the hell they want to do. If Ukraine wants to join NATO and NATO wants us, them to join, then that's none of Russia's business in my view. I think Russia knows um, that NATO is not an actual aggressive threat. We would never actually invade the territory of Russia because of the nuclear nuclear threat. So I think that's actually just uh, nonsense. So yeah. that's sort of my take on it. Um, I do think that the – like I think – I agree with Hans in the end. I think NATO should not be involved in this. I think we should not be arming Ukraine. I think Ukraine should compromise. I don't think that's a good thing. I just think it's, it's probably the best way to avoid you know mass casualties. Um, and Russia is just a bully and a thug. Um, anyway, that's my take on this. I have notes already written down. I have notes from what you just said. I think we can cover a lot of ground here from that, that intro. That's, that's great. Um, first thing, maybe just to keep it very, very simple again, back to the sort of, let's say, Central and Eastern European view of the world. And yes, for anyone who knows their history, we're never going back to the Soviet Union. We never want to be, we never wanted to be a part of the Soviet Union. We're never going to let Ukraine back, fall back into the Soviet Union. So that's one thing. But say our view contrasted with, you know, a libertarian, classical liberal, uh, don't tread on me, I understand it, Texas libertarian view of, of uh, someone in the United States. Here's the interesting line of, of uh, thinking, which I don't understand. And, and it prompted me what you said in your intro comments here is basically, my view is you can be very much anti-Bush, anti-Cheney, anti-Iraq, Afghan invasion, which the US did with no one by their side in the early 2000s after 9-11, except for Great Britain, Tony Blair, the prime minister of the United States, we had no one by our side internationally. So clearly that was a violation of international law. You can be against that and also be against Putin's kleptocratic, megalomaniacal invasion of Ukraine in 2022. To me, those are completely consistent moral ideological views in the year 2022, yet somehow U.S. libertarians in particular don't seem to see it that way. Yeah, I think that's right. Now, to his credit, like Hans Hoppe in his talk, he you know he he admits that Putin's a thug and all that. He's not defending Putin. He just sees the bigger the bigger danger to his home country, Germany and Europe, is NATO and the alliance and U.S. domination. So he's focusing on the big picture, and and I can't really argue with that. Um, but I think that American libertarians, especially the anti-war guys, they're so fixated on war as their only issue um, that they're almost willing to turn a blind eye towards the nature, the reality of the situation, like Putin's thuggishness and you know the actual invasion, the aggression that's happening with this invasion. Because if they, they're afraid if they if they admit what's really happening, that they're buying into okay, then we have to. You know, the West has to get involved and defend Ukraine. So, like, they're afraid to admit the truth. So they end up distorting the truth and downplaying things that are plain to everyone, like Russia's thuggishness and the horror that is this war and the murder that's happened. I mean, people's lives are being destroyed by the by the millions, I, I would imagine, in, in, in Ukraine. I mean, it's horrible. Um yeah, so if you demonize them as neo-Nazis and all this, it helps to assuage it and say, oh, Russia is just defending their uh, traditionally Russian people. Ukraine was never a nation. All this complete bullshit. 
Um, I think they're just coming up with arguments that sound like what Putin would say just to avoid war because, like, that's that's their main goal. And I agree with them. We should avoid war. But, you know, you can have a reasonable balance in the middle. You can say, listen, we're going to identify – uh, the actual aggressor here, which is Russia, <laughs> it doesn't mean Ukraine's an angel, <laughs> right? And yeah. the U.S. doesn't have to give support or the West. But but um, so I think you can have a middle ground. You can you can you know if you're an anarchist, you can you can, you can oppose all types of states. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me ask you one about the nuclear question. Not necessarily, you know, what Putin may or may not do. That that narrative changes every day. Uh, as people who have been following this, and I know a lot of Americans do not even want to follow this because it's uh, <laughs> just you know out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Uh, he's was making threats. Now he says he's never made threats. This, this just goes back and forth. But a more philosophical, general question about nukes, and you may not have an answer for this, but you know, so say nukes and the state, right? Like no one likes nukes, but the state invented nukes. You know, now the state is like the caretaker of nukes. Russia obviously has the largest nuclear stockpile in the world. How do we reconcile this, all of this with, with free market theory? I mean, is there a free market denuclearization program? Well, okay, so a couple of things. People say Russia has the largest stockpile, but given Russian technology, we have to, <laughs> it might not work. We have yeah. to assume yeah. half of them won't work. So. Yeah, but, yeah true. Uh, true. Which is not really a good thing. I mean, um, it makes it more dangerous in a sense. Um, I mean, the... the there's a like as a counterpoint to the to the Hoppe talk. Um, there's a a guy Sam Harris who I don't like a lot because he's really a mainstreamer and he's really annoying. But he had yeah. this guy Timothy Snyder on recently in one of his recent episodes, episode three hundred one. I sent you the link. It's, it's on making sense, and he he knows a lot about uh, the history of all this. And great you know, historian. He he makes a pretty good point that um, that um, about the risk of nuclear war, like. Like you could be increasing the risk of nuclear war by giving in to his nuclear blackmail, right? Like right now, um, yeah. because it will embolden him and all that. I mean, I used to be terrified at the prospect of a nuclear world, which is obviously where we're heading someday. But you know, if you think about it, it's kind of impressive that the U.S. has been able to uh, get its, uh, you know, its 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 vassal states like Japan and Germany. Not to not to have nukes uh, in Canada, et cetera, under the and under the promise that we're going to protect them with our umbrella. When I think it's becoming pretty clear that you know, if Russia did somehow attack, I don't know, Germany or Japan uh, or China attack Japan uh, or Taiwan, I don't think the U.S. would actually use nukes to respond. So, yeah. and uh, that's that's going to become apparent at some point, which means that like South Korea and Japan. And Germany and Canada, you know, they can instantly go nuclear because they're 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 very rich, high tech, you know, industrialized countries, and I think that they will. And I, you know, so but let's imagine that Ukraine had never given up their nukes after after the fall of the USSR. Uh, yeah, put a so, pass memorandum. Yeah, so let's imagine every country has nukes, even the backwards ones. You know, yeah. um, it's going to be a more dangerous world in a way. But maybe a world with no war. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> now, the, yeah. the problem is when people can print nukes in their basement with their 3D printers. That that's going to be the problem because there's Muslims out there that will, you know they will they will use that and and crazy terrorists. Um, but uh, yeah. for for a certain point in time, I think that. But I think that's where we're heading. But the, you know, the, right now the the U.S. has dominated. And so Hans is right. Hoppe is right that Germany and Europe have been dominated by the um, this hegemony of the U.S. and our nuclear umbrella and NATO. Um, and but but my view, like Russia, I don't think Russia is really threatened by NATO. Russia is threatened by the fact that you know they basically have an authoritarian state and people. Are living in a, a quasi slave state, and you yeah. know they're embarrassed by by their puny status now. They used to be a world power, now they're just like you know a thug thugocracy with 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 nukes. There's a lot of libertarians that want to like live forever, and maybe we'll become cyborgs in the uh, certain sci fi sense. But I'm not sure we'll get there in in our lifetime, so it might not be something we have to worry about. But like in the long long distance future, if we if we want to philosophize about this. 
I don't know if you just compare nukes to like gun ownership and that sort of thing as far as, you know, how we all defend ourselves and how the state doesn't grow too big. Or if we can sort of in the near future and stop arguing, arguing amongst ourselves among these like sort of petty points, like I don't know how the free market necessarily handles nuclear weapons. It's a strange it's a strange thing. Unfortunately, the, the state gave it to us. The state gave it to us, and now <laughs> we have it. I tend to think that you know technology uh, comes about when its time has come, right? Uh, different. So I think nuclear weapons and nuclear power um, would have come about at a certain point in human development, even without states behind it. Um, so the question is, what you know? So if you imagine a future peaceful, prosperous, anarcho-capitalist society. What would be the status of nukes? Um, I don't think they would be flat, flat out outlawed because I think there are peaceful uses of nukes. You know, uh, uh, blowing up asteroids or whatever, mining, um, mm. or even some some defensive purposes. But um, anyway, the point is, once knowledge is there, you can't outlaw it. Really, um, could you imagine sort of? But but I do think that like uh, yeah, you could imagine like neighborhood <laughs> associations, covenants, regions with agreements like. Look, you can't live here unless you have insurance, and you can't get insurance unless you pledge not to have nuclear bombs in your basement, right? Because you're too much of a risk for your insurer to handle. So I, I do think right. that there would be a tendency for these things to be rare, and especially in a world of prosperity and peace and commerce. I don't I, – I, a future – like if we're, if we're really imagining a future world of rationality and like this utopian dream – Right. May you know, I, may, maybe there would be very little conflict, and so it just wouldn't come up. The problem is in a in a peaceful, docile society, the temptation for that one guy on the edge to become the marauder. You know, yeah. yep. if everyone leaves their doors unlocked, you know, eventually one guy is going to say, "Oh, I could just walk around and steal steal things from people's refrigerators because they don't lock their doors." Like, if yeah. all you need is one defector. So economically speaking, I think there will always be crime because if we have very little crime, our defenses will be lowered, and then that will give an increased incentive to the people on the very, very edge and the margin to treat. But on the other, on the other hand, maybe in such a rich future society, we won't care. Yeah, yeah. okay, some guy stole my banana. I don't care. I've got another banana, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and by the same token, maybe crime won't be necessary. I mean, why do you steal? to get things that you don't own. But if we have a, su a super abundant society where charity can take care of things and, uh, you know, so it's hard to imagine this future. Free world. energy, maybe. <laughs> Free energy, everything. Yeah. yeah, right. If we can do coal fusion someday, right? Yeah, that's enough, I think, on the nuclear question. It's not nothing, obviously, we'll solve on this podcast, but it's, I agree with you, and I think it is overblown, at least at this point. Uh, I hope I hope we're correct in that. But, um, well, one more thing, I guess, this general on the, we can get back to Ukraine, but general on sort of the development of, the state or the diminution of the state in the future based on libertarian philosophy. I believe you may not be a huge fan of him, but I, I find some of his YouTube debates interesting. But one thing that David Friedman has said was basically that what his father said was he thought anarcho-capitalism probably wouldn't work, but it might. And he likes to say, David Friedman likes to say that anarcho-capitalism probably would work, but it might not. And then his sort of addendum is, you know, we ne never could be completely sure if that anarcho-capitalist society might decide to just form another state amongst themselves. And I do think that's an interesting way to put it. I mean, we might never know, and maybe we'll just never get there anyway. But Yeah, actually, Rothbard has an interesting quote about this. He says something like, um, okay, well, one criticism of anarchy is that if you ever achieve it, it's just going to eventually devolve into another state. Well, that's a weird criticism. It's like saying, well you shouldn't try to have something better because it won't last forever or something like that. Was that Friedman's criticism of Rothbard? It might have been. It's just a minarchist, I think it's a minarchist criticism of anarchy, like yeah. that it's not stable. But, yeah. the point, but Rothbard said, it, you know, if we do this, at least, you can you can Google this, at least we will have, a, have had a glorious holiday, <laughs> like a temporary <laughs> reprieve from the state, you know. Um Yeah. But but to me, it's like, this is this is the problem with these, 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 the people that criticize, they're basically statists because they want a system, they want a plan. And they, they're saying, okay, 
here's our plan because we're just a type of statist. We don't want to call ourselves statists, but we're just, you know, even minarchists, like they're all statists. They, they just, you know, there's, dem- there's Democrats, there's fascists, there's, there's totalitarians, there's theocrats, there's commies. And, and, and we're minimal staters. Okay, whatever. So we have a system. What's your anarchist plan? Right. And they, they want us to have a plan. So, was, yeah. so that's why they always demand these questions of it. They say, well, if we get, if we get rid of the Federal Reserve um, or if we get rid of uh, welfare, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be? If we get rid of uh, government schools, um, can you guarantee that every kid's going to have an education, blah, blah, blah? So that they have this mentality of we have to have a plan and you have to stand behind it and pro- make promises, which, by the way, the promises never – You know, even the people that promise Social Security, they can't guarantee that Social Security is going to be there in 30 years when our kids are – you know. Absolutely. Ready. I mean, you can't promise anything. You can't guarantee anything. But they want you to. So if you say so, so if you take this moderate libertarian approach, like, oh well, um, we shouldn't have welfare and we shouldn't have government schools. We should have private schools and charity. And then the instant response from the status minded person is, well, can you guarantee that there's going to be enough private charity to handle all the poor? So they want to guarantee. In other words, they're, they're never going to give up on their idea of a government solution, right? Um, yep. So it's like a false dilemma. Yep, yep. Okay, uh, let's get back then to Ukraine a little bit or more the question of like security, borders. It's actually interesting in light of what you're talking about, about anarcho-capitalist theory versus say everything else. Like I, I look around the world in 2022, I have troubles myself, you know, philosophizing about these things when, like you said, you know, just Ukrainians, in my view, are basically dying for the rest of the free world because of a kleptocratic dictatorial regime that does not follow the rules, simply does not follow the rules. So uh, here's my question. Um, And you mentioned Hoppe. I definitely will link to these uh, PFS uh, speeches that you mentioned. I have a question about him regarding the state and borders and security and private property today when we're not in sort of this future anarcho-capitalist world. My understanding is... Does he not conclude that um, as we have governments sort of today in the modern world, that they are the best way to enforce border security and hence some sort of property of the state? I mean, isn't that his, his, one of his conclusions of just sort of practicality of... Are you talking about of, like immigration? What do you mean? I guess immigration might be the way that he's framed it, but I would uh, relate the Russian invasion to the same thing. I mean, we're talking about borders and border security and who would defend the borders, right, if you were invaded. Let's get to the question of whether the United States should help or Western Europe should help next. But just generally, philosophically, isn't it true that he, he does have a, sort of a, I don't know if it's a concession, but it's just a view that basically, yeah, in, in, the, mo- in the modern world today, we're going to have to have someone defend the borders and that's going to have to be the state. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Um, and I may be wrong. I thought that was a kind of a common one, but I, it could be. But I'm not. I'm, I'm not immediately aware of it. And it may be it's something he's written or said that I haven't. Uh, that I don't remember. But uh, I don't think that's the right way to characterize his view. Okay. Well, let me let me just interrupt then, because if that I thought that was actually kind of at least from my view, I thought that was like kind of a common. Like I remember a paper. I'll try to find it. I remember a paper between Walter Block. And someone else refuting Hoppe on this point, where Block was very much open borders, you know, there's plenty of land for everybody, open it all up. And Hoppe was not of that view, and they were criticizing him, his works. I'll try to find it. I can talk about his immigration views, but as, as more of a general thing, um, I, 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 it just doesn't ring a bell to me. Okay, let's keep it back to generally as you think of it, as you view. Security, borders, an aggressive nation is attacking you. Clearly, in 2022, we can we can be of the mind that you're going to have to have a state. And if you want to ask another state for help, like that's not anti-human or that's not anti- uh, Well, yeah, especially because not, not every country is the United States, right? I mean, right. Uh, uh, American, so one unfortunate thing I think is that um, uh, the libertarian movement sort of basically originated here in the U.S. And so a lot of libertarian stuff you read is from the American perspective and you know, Americans say crazy things like, oh, we should be energy independent and all this stuff. It's like, well, I mean, like actually maybe we could be, but most countries are going to be 
small and they need to trade with other people. And no one's totally independent. I mean, we live in a world trade order. Um, so, yeah. um, and so by the same token, I think you can, you can imagine no, you know, not every country is the world's superpower that has nuclear weapons and a big Navy and, you know, um, can dominate the world like, like the U S does. I mean, basically no one can except one country. So, the, the norm is for what every other country faces. They have to make alliances. They have to have pacts. They have to have treaties. They have to cooperate. You know, they have to trade. So I, I think there's clearly nothing libertarian, unlibertarian whatsoever with countries um, allying together in these alliances. It seems quite simple to me, and but that's that's really what you battle. And again, I'm not on a huge crusade here, but um, you know, I've talked about it a little bit. There are prominent libertarians in the U.S. that um, that have been sort of touting this line that it's you know again whether it's complete just disillusionment with the U.S. federal government, which I understand, I certainly understand it as a libertarian. But if you're talking about the reality of the situation of people dying, there's five million Ukrainians that have been uh, alleged to be deported, deported against their will to Russia. Well, what's the population of Ukraine? Forty, forty million. What do you think that the U.S. and NATO should be doing? I'm curious. If we go back to 2014, I'll give you the long answer, okay? I'm going to give you the long answer and let you respond. If you go back to 2014, and even in the uh, earlier days, like in Georgia in 2008, uh, for those that were paying attention when, uh, when Russia went in, Russia has always been aggressive in this, in this part of the world, Central and Eastern Europe, and obviously in the Baltics here. My father's from, family's from Latvia originally, so whether it's the ba- Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland specifically suffered horribly. Timothy Snyder, as you mentioned, has written great books on Poland and, and Ukraine and all the, I mean, it's, you know, Bloodlands, people should read it. That's a very simple expose on the whole situation. Like we know <laughs> an aggressive neighbor and one was Nazi Germany, the other was Soviet Russia. So that's obviously the stage. That's, that's where we are looking at this, coming at this from. But if you talk about sort of kind of the past 10, 15 years, let's just you know keep it local, libertarian stuff. So I was telling American libertarian friends, like it is not a good thing when say even Ron Paul, the great Ron Paul gets on RT to talk about classical liberalism. Now that, I think that looks pretty good in hindsight, but at the time, even someone like Ron, and there were plenty, right? Obviously there was Adam Kokesh, you know, Stefan Molyneux, there was a lot of, a lot of people were on there. They would argue, all of these people would argue that getting on a wide reaching platform, you know, is a paying subs- cable subscription news service, RT, in the early 2010s, uh, to talk about liberty was a great thing. Like any form you could do is a great thing. And even the great Ron Paul was doing it. And we're like screaming here from Eastern Europe, like this is the worst thing that you can be doing. You don't understand that you're in the throes of Russian NPR just bashing the United States. And those that already agree with you are going to agree with you. Those that might be on the fence, they may become sort of mad January 6th. Or, you know, like, obviously, I wasn't predicting those things, but that was a clear, let's say, problem from a... Uh, a clear statist uh, disinfo sort of campaign that unfortunately libertarians were a part of. So just from that as a, as a micro level, that was something that was already a problem. And then come 2014, it was almost like they had, they had prepped for it. Like Russia had allowed the West to see that, oh, really, you know, Ukraine is just like sort of a non-existent country. They've had these issues, but, you know, Crimea was always part of Russia, which isn't true at all. Um, you know, 600 years of Ottoman rule before the Russians and they were an autonomous uh, state for the first half of the Soviet Union. It was actually an autonomous area before it was, you know, Khrushchev gifted it to Ukraine, all of these things that just, everybody just fell on complete deaf ears. Yes, and Snyder, so, Snyder goes into that in that interview with Harris a lot, uh, which I, I never knew about, but it was illuminating. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you had the Genoans, you had Jews, you had, I mean, there was... Crimea, you know, it's, it's a, it happens in ports, right? It, happens, it was a free port. Like it happened in, you know, Singapore, Hong Kong. These places had no resources, just barren rocks. And once you open it up for trade, great things can happen. Unfortunately, Russia didn't allow that with, with Crimea, right? That's just that they wanted it for themselves. And that was, that was that. So when that happened in 2014, we were again saying this just falls on deaf ears. We were calling about the Budapest memorandum, all of these things. And the West took no action. So rather than the standard libertarian view of we caused this, we were NATO encroachment, all this stuff, which is again, another non sequitur. I mean, 
NATO, again, sorry, I know I'm going on a lot of different topics here, but I think it's, it's always relevant. When Gorbachev was promised by Reagan in the 1980s, the not one inch, the Baker quote, that had nothing to do about NATO, that all that was doing was talking about the reunification of Germany, which was the front and center political view of the day with Helmut Kohl and with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, the Soviet foreign minister. When they were all in these rooms talking with Baker, that was in a pre-free era of Russia. That was still in the Soviet era. Like the, War- the Warsaw Pact was on, the Soviet Union was on. These things existed. Like no one, of course NATO wouldn't have been on the table as Gorbachev said in 2014. Like it wasn't even discussed talking about NATO because <laughs> the Warsaw Pact, which was like Poland, you know, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, all these countries still existed as, as Soviet vassal states. And that's just the world that it was. So yeah, sorry, you wanted to say something. Well, I was, I was just say like from an, an international law perspective, you have these libertarians saying, oh, well, um, the U.S. promised not to extend NATO and they went back on their promise. So Russia is justifiably uh, grieved. That's complete, that's complete bullshit. I mean, a, I mean, yeah. first of all, these are, these are actually superpowers. These are big countries. They have lawyers. They, they know, how, they know, they, they can hire experts to negotiate their agreements. You know, they, they know when they have a treaty and when they, when they don't. And they didn't have a treaty. You can't just say, oh, well, George Bush said it. And, uh, so, so. Yeah, it was mentioned in the meeting minutes of this. Uh, That's not how it works. I mean, these, these yeah. are big boys. And, and, and there, there was, this is complete nonsense. It, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I get too excited. Go ahead. The libertarians who are so anti-war and they become so anti-U.S. and so anti-Israel – um, a little suspiciously, I might add. I mean, they're a little too anti-Israel. You know, it's like, okay, I know they're not perfect, but I mean, if you lived over there, where would you want to live, you know? Um, <laughs> so I just think that they're, they're so desperate to avoid war that they just will demonize what they see as the big player, the U.S., and, and uh, no matter what. And, you know, it's not always our fault, <laughs> even though yeah. we have a horrible central state that has caused lots of problems. It's not always yeah. America's fault. Great point. Totally agree with you. And um, I, I just, I will argue with anybody uh, till I'm blue in the face. Like that had nothing, even Gorbachev in 2014 reiterated this. He was never promised anything. And anyway, like you said, there was no treaty. Nothing was ever written down. It was not a, it's not even an oral promise. There was, and anyway, it could not have been. Like the Soviet Union was on. Yes, the Baltics were agitating for independence already in 89. But that statement was in early 1990. The Soviet Union didn't end until 1991. There was no place for NATO to expand. It was never even a question. It's a made up history that is thrown around just so erroneously. So anyway, that's another thing. So all that, I guess, is laying the groundwork to answer your question about what would I have done. Uh, First of all, I would absolutely agree with you that the United States does, unfortunately, play too big of a role in European politics, and that's a problem. Hans Hermann Hoppe, I believe, understands that's a problem, and it is a problem. My point would be there, Europe should have done much, much more. The only people that were going to Georgia in 2008 and Ukraine in 2014, as I understood, were like the Poles, the Balts, well, the Jordans went to Ukraine after, just to show solidarity. But like all of Western Europe was just saying, well, we need cheap Russian gas. And that was, uh, that was the idea. So it was two lacks of diplomacy from Western Europe leading up to the invasion, all the way going back to 2014. And then the disinfo campaign, as I mentioned, is real. Like if you don't think it's real, you're just living with your you know, head in the sand. I mean, it, Russia has 30 million Russians living abroad, 30 million. And that's not as many as Chinese and Indians, as I understand. But an interesting fact about that is, the only reason that they have 30 million Russians living abroad is precisely because of their tyrannical dictatorial regime at home. <laughs> That's a hundred years of Russians fleeing Russia. <laughs> Gives you 30 million Russians abroad. And then ironically leads to Vladimir Putin in the 2010 saying, okay, we need this Ruski Mir, this Novorossiya. We need this Russian world where we're basically going to try to use these Russians that live abroad to, you know, come home, bring them into the fold, create things like RT. Hey, we're going to get U.S. hating Americans to come on RT. Like it was beautifully played, frankly, from them in the early 2010s and 2000s when we just didn't care, right? We just, we just didn't care. So, so my point of all that is basically diplomacy and peace and trade definitely work, but it's not a free lunch. And it's, you have to, at least in 2022, where we do have states, I mean, you have to stand up to people that violate international law. And we never did that. So that 2014 was, was the big problem. And then when it came to 2022, 
my personal view is if NATO had acted in the early days, it would have been better. Maybe controversial to stay, but I mean, in the very, very early days when not even they'd gone in yet, but if they had just, and, and yes, I know that the U.S. provides the majority of the NATO budget, you know, some 60, some 60 to 70% of the NATO budget. I know that. I know it's hard to talk about NATO without talking about the U.S., but this was telegraphed for months and months. Like, you know, I got podcasts from last year talking about <laughs> Russia's aggression and rising threat uh, to the world and to Ukraine. They were, you know, taking their, sending their tanks on rails from Asia already in like November of last year. We did nothing. Like the Baltics send them some stingers. Nobody did anything before they actually invaded on, on February 24th. So I think that's another folly. I think that deterrence is important and pacifism is absolutely the wrong thing. If you want to be a pacifist, and sometimes I don't know the difference between non-interventionism as the libertarians define it, and pacifism. Sometimes I don't know the difference. I, I wouldn't use the word isolationism. That's a bad 19th century word. But pacifism is never going to work. It's never, ever going to work. We are witnessing what, you, what pacifism brings. I think that's what, that's what we're witnessing right now. Well, so what's interesting to me is, um, I think from an American libertarian perspective, like five years ago, RT was like just this sort of cool, edgy, alternative yeah. media platform, right? Um, and they even call themselves RT. They don't say Russia Today. Like, like they're trying to downplay it, like Kentucky right. Fried Chicken rebranded, rebranded themselves to KFC to avoid right. to avoid saying fried. So it was just RT was this cool thing. So all these libertarians, all, a lot of my buddies, hell, I might have been on there. I don't remember. but <laughs> I don't think you were. But <laughs> I don't think I was, but, but I, I, I have some friends that were for sure. Um, and they were all, oh, they're, they're like fighting the, you know, the, the media narrative in America. But from the, from the perspective of you libertarians in Central Euro Eastern Europe, you're like, you guys are like, <laughs> you're like uh, making a deal with the devil. <laughs> it's, it's come home to roost. Like, here we are. Uh, it's really bad. Uh, every day, Ukrainians are dying. You know, I don't know how broad you want to take this discussion, but it's not necessarily looking like support is growing for Ukraine in the U.S. I don't know. Maybe you have a different take on that. Um, I haven't seen any big erosion. Uh, there's still Ukraine, you know, banners and flags all over Houston where I live. Um, mm. um, I, you know, and I actually have some small hope that Ukraine actually can, I won't say win because I don't know, I don't know what it means to win. I, I can't imagine Russia withdrawing from everywhere they've conquered and just like giving up unless there's some kind of weird coup there um, or collapse. But um, I could imagine some kind of like Ukrainian victory where they're able to like get Russia to like say, okay, we're going to give up. We're going to negotiate some kind of terms of terms of, uh, you know, some new treaty. Um, uh, and I hope that that happens because I, I mean, I actually think Russia is, uh, I would love to see Russia like collapse. You know, I mean, like, you know, the common narrative is that, you know, Reagan increased American spending in the 80s and, and the, the, so the commies couldn't keep up. So they finally collapsed. I don't know if that narrative is actually 100 percent correct, but um, I wouldn't mind seeing Russia like totally uh, deplete itself of their money and their wealth and their and their system in this stupid war, that, which finally, which finally depletes their coffers and they finally collapse. And they, I mean, I would love to see Russia become a modern cosmopolitan, you know, liberal yeah. nation in the future. Uh, I just yeah. don't, I don't see their, I don't see, I think it's, it's not in the mentality of the people. I mean, I mean, the people are fine, but you know, it's like, it's just not in their, I don't see it happening anytime soon. I would love, I would love for that to happen. I mean, and I, I, I want to avoid nuclear war on the way out of all this too. So, you know, that's sort of my simple minded perspective. I remember back in like February, March, the Russians, they were trying to justify their invasion as they always do is, you know, we're the, the aggrieved party here. We're not the aggressors. It's the same type of thing. And so they, they, they expanded their list, which is like, you know, a thousand meters long at this point, but they expanded their list of uh, persona non grata and people that were enemies of the Russian state. And one of them was even Hillary Clinton. And I remember you actually, ironically, I don't know if you remember this, but you, you actually liked the tweet and said something that she was actually being funny here because Clinton, you know, of all people, Hillary Clinton said, you know, I actually thank Russia for, for this Lifetime Achievement Award. 
And it's true. I mean, look. Yeah, I, it's pretty bad when someone is so bad that they make you actually say something nice about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yes. And I, are we are we so odd that we can use, you know, two parts of our brain to to think differently about two different situations or or what? I just I cannot quite understand why this is uh, these principles are so hard for certain people to follow. I don't know, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something, but I totally agree with your with your sentiments there. I just think that they have focused so much on the US as being the the big evil guy that they 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 have more, they have like um they just can't see past that that framing. And um you know, it's like this this is part of the problem I think with having a one issue thing. I mean, you know, some people accuse me of this with intellectual property cuz like I see everything in that term. Mm. Although I think I have some basis for my arguments, but I don't say that intellectual property is the only thing, you know, there is taxation and the fed and, you know, expropriation. Sure. Um, but so, but I think some people are so worried about like war is their only issue. Um, some of the anti-war team people, which I, like I support their, their opposition to war, but yeah. war is not the only issue. It's just the reason we're against war is because we favor peace, freedom, prosperity, you know, liberalism, cosmopolitanism, you know, ideas, inter social intercourse, you know, civilization, society. I mean, it's just like it, it's a consequence of deeper values that we all share as civilized people. Um, and but by virtue of holding those values, you're going to favor, you know, other things, you know, like other policies that have nothing to do with war. Do you think that there's a real future for the federal government in the United States to, I don't know, ease up on its power? You know, I mean, like, because as you, I think, rightly pointed, like, uh, you know, you're anti-commie, anti-red, all of these things that, you know, when you were growing up, obviously it was so obvious that the Soviet Union was wrong. Uh, I think there are many things that's obvious that the federal government is overreaching in the United States. Do you think that there is a real future there that the federal government will ease up on some of its power? Or are, we, are we still careening towards some train wreck there? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I don't think any group ever gives up their power voluntarily. Like you even have charities and groups that were formed for some purpose and they actually achieve their mission, like you know, they cured some disease and then they just shift, they just shift, right? Because they don't mm -hmm. want to, they don't give up their power, their donors, and their and their structure. So I don't think that governments will dissipate because they will ever give up power. They will always cling to it. Um, my hope is that um, is that the federal government, say in the U.S., will become more like the monarchy in England. Like over time, it will become a vestige or a legacy of the old order and more like a curiosity piece or, you know, it's not worth abolishing it and it's there for institutional reasons, but it like has less and less power because the, the free market, the private order um, becomes so dominant around it. I mean, if you have a, a future world, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like a hundred, a thousand years from now where people have such high tech knowledge and such super wealth that they can defend themselves or local neighborhood groups can defend themselves. And, you know, you can grow your own food and have robots that do your surgery. At a certain point, all the arguments for the state disappear because the state is there. They always claim that they're there to solve a problem that you can't solve on your own, right? Like security or healthcare or housing or food. But when that stuff becomes plentiful and abundant because of the free market, then the government's role will naturally retrench. So I can imagine a future world where the federal government still exists, but it's like 1% of, of the whole country's economic activity. So it's like a showpiece. I mean, that's, yeah. my, that's my naive utopian uh, hope. I'm not saying yeah. I'm, I'm I'm not saying I'm predicting it, but I'm I think that's the only way that we will achieve a future free society is a natural sort of dim, diminution of the um, of the of, of the of the state role, and then uh, the natural dominance of private institutions that supplant those roles. I certainly hope we get there. I know I said I didn't want to do one any more on nukes, but I actually have one more. One of the examples, I guess, that I do hear from the anti-war folks a lot 
is if Ukraine did have their nukes or yeah, NATO is expanding to Russian, the Russian border, which again, we all went through the obvious holes there, let alone the fact that Sweden and Finland are now joining Finland, which has, you know, thousands of kilometers of border <laughs> with Russia. So good job, Vladimir Putin, on uh, that deterrence from your side. Uh, so th- it's just nonsense in my view, but still let's, let's just assume, and it may be a grand assumption, but it is an assumption that they make a lot, the people that support uh, Putin even in this war. Let's say that China decides to make an extraterritorial agreement with a Central American nation or even Mexico for whatever reason and have more military bases, maybe even some nukes right on the U.S.'s border. Uh, How would the U.S. react to that? What would the U.S. think about from that perspective? That's supposedly justifying the, the Russian side if we would think about that question. I think that's unpredictable. I mean, I think that in, in a sense, the Chinese threat is is bizarre because, you know, to the extent that China is actually emerging from communism and becoming, you know, a, a quasi-capitalist productive power, which they have become in the last 20 years, um, that's actually a good thing, right? So when we say that's a threat, that's not a threat. It's actually a good thing. Um and then you know half the thre- half the not to bring it back to my hobby horse IP, but half the threats you hear is like China stealing our they're stealing our IP. You hear this all over. You hear this all the time. It's like it makes no- and people say it and they don't even know what they're talking about because they don't even understand what IP is because yeah. like China is like literally not stealing our IP because IP is a territorial thing. It's a national thing. Like patent law in America and copyright law in America is one thing. Like it's impossible to violate, it's impossible to infringe a patent or copyright of an American citizen or company by anything you do in China. It's impossible. They can violate, I mean, it's just not, that's not the way the law works. They're national laws. They can violate. Chinese patent law if they're violating a Chinese patent. So then you're just saying, oh, we don't think they have a good legal system. Okay, yeah, well, they don't have the same tort laws we have. They don't have the same insurance law, the same contract law, same marriage law. They, Hey, they might not even recognize gay marriage over there. I don't know. I mean, is that really wh- why you want to go to war against China because they don't have the same gay marriage laws we do? I mean, you know what I mean? It's like their local law is irrelevant. Yeah. So China is actually not stealing our IP. So we hear these weird criticisms. So we hear criticism of China because they're competing with us, which is a good thing because they're more prosperous, or because they're stealing our IP, which makes no sense. Um, I actually think the other thing is, might be more likely, which is I think China is like a house of cards about to collapse because they're a bunch of commies and they haven't yep. they haven't really become capitalist, and so they can only. They can only uh, prosper so, for so long on this initial surge of energy they got from slight, liberaliza- slight liberalization because they had a lot of low-hanging fruit. But they haven't gone all the way, so their stupid command and control bullshit is going to catch up with them. I mean, just like with Russia. I don't think Russia can afford the war in Ukraine. I don't think China can afford all the insane half commie shit they've been doing. So. I, I mean, I, I don't want to say I don't see China as a threat because I don't think they would be a threat even if they were successful. If they were successful, it'd be a good thing, you know. So yeah. I, I guess that's how I see um, China. I think the West should, you know, of course the West is sabotaging itself because the West was dominant because of certain institutions and characteristics. But we've we've we, we've done our best to try to kill those things, right? with the welfare yeah. state and democracy and reg- business regulations and taxation. But even given all that, I think that, you know, the West still has the advantage because we have the stronger capitalist institutional framework, despite all the, the ways that the, the, the state and the society hampers it. That whole question about China's dominance is way front running the reality of uh, just poor, a poor communist underbelly. dominance. It's, it's a very poor way to, to view the world. And we've actually seen that, you know, with COVID, the way they've handled COVID. It's a bit scary the way that power has been, you know, sort of wrangled in by Xi. 
And I don't know if you saw that Hu Jintao, the former Secretary General, was escorted out of that yeah. uh, the Congress a couple of weeks ago and all those things, all this theater, all this Soviet stuff. And it's so funny because there's a book, interesting book by Mervyn King, a former governor of the Bank of England. And he was, he was kind of ominous about it in his book. Um, he, he's, he's a pretty balanced guy, actually. He's kind of like a Volcker type, he's kind of hawkish, whatever. He's still a central banker, so not a, you know, but you can learn interesting things from reading these types of books. And he was saying how he had a meeting with a bunch of Chinese technocrats, bureaucrats, whoever they were, uh, many years ago. And they said, you know, we've learned all your history. We studied British history, colonial history, American history. We're going to do it better with our own technocratic, communistic way. We're not going to make the same mistakes you did. And, you know, it's just famous last words, right? Like they didn't handle COVID well. They're still not handling COVID well. They screwed the whole world in the process. And they're looking quite bad as far as uh, what they might do with next steps with Taiwan, whatnot. It's, it's ominous still. It's a bit scary. But, you know, the real estate market, all the ghost cities, all those things, like those are, those are certainly real. And those are certainly problems that they're going to have to deal with. Yeah, I, I saw some, uh, some video recently. Some guy was talking about uh, just reminding us of this, the Japan scare, like the Red Scare yeah. from, from the 90s. Like, remember, there's all these novels and movies like, oh, Japan was yeah. about to, like Japan was the big threat. Yeah, from the 80s even, from the 80s. Yeah, and so yeah. it's like, I don't know, what, what, what do you mean the threat? I mean, like, if you have a, 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 an economic superpower, that, that's actually, so this is the economic ignorance here, like illiteracy. Um, an economic superpower is actually good for everyone because, you know, they produce more and they trade more with you and all that stuff. So yeah. if Japan had actually become more, more, I mean, they're very powerful and prosperous even now, despite their recessions and their money printing, stagflation, <laughs> and what you know, all the ways they've done, they they've screwed it up following the Western model, right? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess they suffer the burden of, yeah, they got a Western constitution imposed on them by the U.S. after World War II, but but then they also got the Western bullshit about central banks and you know so so they they've they've suffered under that policy too but um but yeah so i think that this whole this whole chinese threat thing is 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 ridiculous uh unless china became warlike because they also have a lot of nukes you know but i don't see china or or russia wanting to destroy the entire planet with a nuclear armageddon i hope <laughs> i hope <laughs> I mean, Putin's interest is to stay in power. And my understanding is if he goes nuclear in any way, shape or form, uh, he kind of understands that he's going to face a grave threat to his power. So that's Putin's interest is, is Putin alone. You know, he's a psychopath, narcissist, all the typical characteristics. He's, he's just not, he's not anyone that cares about the people. And unfortunately, the Russian people are people that don't stand up for that. So, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be their problem and they're going to have to solve it. So what's your prediction of, what's probably going to happen in the Ukraine war in the next year or so? Well, uh, winter's going to be tough, but I feel pretty heartened that, you know, gas prices are falling and all of the storage capacity is like up even to 90% in Europe, which they tried to get it to 80% by November. My understanding is it's close to 90% right now. That's very, very good. And, you know, everybody's prepared. Everybody's united. Um, I think that it's going to be a very hard winter. It's going to continue on. Putin will probably in his own bastardly way, try to make Ukrainians' lives miserable throughout the winter while at the same time signaling, okay, now it's finally time to talk. I don't think the Ukrainians will, will give into that. So it will continue on. Uh, it will continue on. And then it goes into the summer where, again, I think Ukraine will have more support to counter, more support uh, from you know, the West and the free world to counter. And I think at some point they will, the Russians will exhaust their resources and they will just have to come to some talks. Whether that means all territory back to Ukraine or all territory ex Crimea, you know, I'm not sure, I can't predict, but uh, Ukraine is in no way, shape or form. The people, the Poles, everybody, nobody is predicting that they wanna give up on fighting, you know, the aggressor. And I think, I think they wanna fight until they get all of their territory back. And it's very unfortunate, again, going back to the story that I sort of told of basically Putin's rise to power and how that was overlooked by the West for, for two decades. And especially when, when the war in Crimea started, the taking of Crimea and the war in the Donbass started in 2014. So I think everybody's paying attention now. I think Germans are gonna become more independent uh, economically and energy wise. So I do think that's kind of a wake up call actually. I think it's, Unfortunately, they're still going to have to suffer. And, uh, and that's the issue. And I wonder, I actually had one more kind of 
philosophical question regarding, uh, you know, liberty and property rights and how you build this stuff up. You mentioned how the United States is falling, and as most people know, right, that's a product of central banking and government overreach and all the rest, which we all agree on. What is the role of the institution in sort of today's modern world, do you think with technology, it, it's, it will be allowed to become less important or Ukraine might figure this out in their own way? And I know you're not like an expert on Ukraine, but as far as the principle goes, the United States, uh, I think we all believe was successful because they had strong property rights, but that was still represented by some institution. So it's going back to my sort of classical liberal question, like, do we need an institution to enforce property rights? You know, is it is Bitcoin going to help there? I don't know. Is there any other way? Good question, and I don't know the answer. Uh, but I think that's an, that's the right question to ask. Um, um, it's almost a meta question, like what meta? Yeah, yeah and this is where you get into thickism and uh, Western cultural superiority and all these all these issues, right? Um, like what is going to cause? give rise to like what about a given society gives rise to the right micro institutions that actually you know create wealth yeah um and um i don't know the answer to that i mean i think there's some obvious common sense things there's some uh, i i am sympathetic towards conservatism in the sense of don't don't replace an existing traditional system if you don't know where, how we got there. In other words, it, it might have a logic of its own, which is even, it might be tacit and, and inarticulate. We don't know. But there may be a reason for this tradition. Don't just, don't, don't just change a rule in some rationalist kind of like utopian scheme because you, you might not know what you're going to get. Um, but b- b- by mm-hmm. the same token, what gives rise to success of different cultures, it's hard to say. I mean, obviously the classical virtues, thrift and the Western, you know, uh, uh, honesty, integrity, uh, all these things make sense. And then they're transmitted by societal institutions like religion. I mean, I'm not religious, but I could say that I could see how a religious institution is going to tend to be um, prevalent in most societies until a certain point in time. And they're going to yeah. be the chief mechanisms of transmitting, preserving, uh, teaching, you know, virtues and values and habits. Um, so I, it, it's sort of an empirical thing. We have to just wait and see like which societies like tend to prosper. And sometimes it's luck of the draw. Sometimes it's a long-term tendency or trend. But um, yeah, so I do have some opinions on this, but I'm actually dancing around it because I, I like not to pronounce on things that I, I know I'm not an expert on. But yeah, I am personally drawn towards the Western virtues, um, you know, uh, heterosexual family unit, uh, conservatism and c- cultural conservatism in private practice, um, thrift, virtue, hard work prudence, you know, justice, fairness, all these types of things, that's what I'm drawn to. And I'm a little bit um, cautious enough to be aware that that might be my personal bias or my, my, uh, my own historical bias, but I tend to think that's what's going to, so, but, 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 but the real question is what is going to, like, I actually think that the ideas of liberty um, I think that they're right. Now, what does it mean that they're right? They're right in a normative sense, in a moral sense, in a logical sense. You can argue for them. But you can't just have – nothing's in isolation in the world because that's what it – to exist means to have an effect on other things. So part of, being part of reality is to be interconnected to everything else. So nothing is isolated completely. Like So you can't just isolate off some kind of – uh, intellectual exercise about uh, what a just society would look like. When we say that it's right, we we say that what we mean is that it has a certain um, a rightness about it, which makes it sort of work in a certain context. So I guess my hope and my goal for the human race is that we advance and we keep developing and evolving. We, we reach a point where um, 
the logic of liberty carries its own weight. In other words, you don't have to have liberty because you have libertarians like me and you arguing for it, but, but just because it makes sense. I mean, the free market emerges because people trade because it makes sense to trade. They're not doing it because someone gave them an argument to trade, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so I, I sort of, my distant hope for the human race, for a future human race, it's far better than what we live in now. A future of liberty and freedom and tolerance and, you know, prosperity is one where it's just natural to everyone to respect rights and to live in peace with each other. Because I think the logic of liberty makes sort of sense. Um, I think that it's just too early right now. That's why we seem to struggle and why we have advocates like me and you trying to push for it. We're pushing a little too early maybe because you can't push for something that's before it's time, right? Anyway, I'm rambling yeah. a little bit here, but the, these are a little bit metaphysical speculations. But um, I, I suppose what I think is that um, um, liberty, liberty does work but only with a certain substrate of, of people to work upon. And we're not quite there yet. We're still, we're still way more primitive than we think we are. I, we humans think that we're not like our ancestors 3,000 or 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago because we have airplanes and lasers and <coughs> iPhones. But those are just technological constructs that we sort of came up with um, because a very, 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 very few of us understand those those laws of nature, right? Most people don't understand the tools they're using at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that we think we're advanced and we're we're modern, but we're I think we're actually not in the modern age yet, and that's why liberty is not catching on yet. Um, so I guess I'm hopeful that when the human race evolves, if we don't kill ourselves with gray goo or with nuclear weapons or whatever, um, that we will finally evolve into a modern, you know, society that where, where liberty makes sense naturally on its own. And that, that's my vision of like imagining the government. Oh yeah. The government won't disappear. It'll atrophy. It'll be a vestigial organ, right? It'll just be a symbol of the past, but no one will care because, okay, we'll give them 1% of our income because, they keep they preserve the old order, but nobody cares. We'll see how how much longer that this, uh, this continues is, this in is England. The, <laughs> this is the Omni magazine Kinsella. I know I'm totally crazy here, but what, what can you say? I mean, there's no other way to do it. I mean, you have to wait. <laughs> People say, "How do you achieve liberty?" My answer is wait, <laughs> and they don't like yeah. that answer because they don't want to wait. They want it now. They want to stamp their feet and have it now. And I'm like, why? Well, I, I appreciate that, but. Wishing doesn't make it so, as Ayn Rand said. When you do look at a situation like Ukraine, though, and yes, I understand that there are conflicts all over the world. I understand the U.S. has been a part of conflicts all over the world. But if you look at a situation like Ukraine, where it's clearly been trying for the last 30 years, uh, it's never invaded any country in the last 30 years, to become part of a new society, the West, which like the Baltics have succeeded in, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, everybody has succeeded in, no problem. And by the way, I always say this too, you might like this. I mean, the easiest, quickest argument for any sort of woke SJW, even race-based economic disparity in the United States, the easiest skeleton key for that is just to show them Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, <laughs> literally our populations are 99.9% .9 white. They were generations behind the West at the start of the 20th century. And you know, now they've pretty much caught up in a couple decades after the Soviet Union ended. So what more argument do you need to not have an authoritarian society? That's incredible. So anyway, that is actually a small aside, but the bigger point I think with, uh, with the bigger question that I still have is agreeing with everything you said about the, the distant future, what do you think is the, I don't know, prudent or maybe even like classical liberal way to look at something like the Ukraine war? Kind of going back to what I said before is where you have a state, I mean, what role I don't know if I want to ask this question, but what role should the state play in defending Ukraine? Oh, my God. Well, that's difficult because um, – so the U.S. situation from the U.S. point of view, um, you know, it's rational to say what is the right policy from the interest of American citizens or whatever. 
And part of that is maintaining a world order of uh, respect for international law. Like, uh, so, yeah. I mean, the, U, the UN has been shown to be a little bit toothless because, or, or pointless o- over the years because you have this five-member permanent security council, and they always veto each other's votes on big matters because so, – and Ru- the problem is Russia is still part of the Secu- Security Council's permanent – <laughs> right. And they're they're just like a, a rump nation that a mafia may, state. Yeah, they may be on the verge of imploding. I mean, France, UK, US, fine. China, I don't know. I mean, but basically, I think it should be civilized nations. And uh, but on the other hand, there's real politique there. So, yeah. um, I I think we have to wait and see what happens with the with 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 the with the Ukraine thing. I th- I think that the world has been surprised. At the resilience of the Ukrainian opposition, like I think some people thought, I think I think I read that the U.S. official estimate was assessment was that uh, when Russia invaded, they would have taken over Ukraine in three days. But yeah. but these are the same people that thought we could take over Iraq in like a week, you know. Um, so they misjudged apparently, and the the the, the Ukrainian resistance is sincere and real. And I, I don't think they have any chance of winning without support of the West. Um, so I'm I'm torn. You know, like I, I don't I don't believe in taxation and supporting war and risking nuclear war and all that. But on the other hand, I I want the Ukrainians to win. So, <laughs> or at least to repel the Russian invaders at a certain point, even if they have to give up some territory. I mean, I'm not, I don't I personally am not too concerned about the final resolution of it. But I would like them to emerge, and I think Ukraine will emerge stronger because, um, you know, they were basically uh, an authoritarian basket case in past decades. But they're they're they seem to be sort of becoming a modern Western liberal country. They want to be, right? I think yeah. so, and I think they have a chance to be if they can just escape, if they can just emerge from this war. Now, of course, we're going to have a Marshall Plan, or we're going to—they're going to get billions of dollars of aid to rebuild the country after this is over if they survive. Um, yeah. All I can say is, like, I'm not religious, but I pray for the Ukrainians. I think it's horrible what the Russians are doing. Um, I sympathize with the East Europeans, like yourself. Um, I mean, I was at Turkey and PFS with Hoppus thing, and there were some Polish guys there, and we were all sort of commiserating with each other. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. This this is bad. It just should be. It should not be controversial to condemn an invasion like this. It's bad. Um, whatever your feelings about U.S. and NATO are, you know, I mean, this is just not acceptable in today's world. Yeah, in my, in my view. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I completely agree. Well, listen, this has been uh, this has been really good stuff. And I don't know. Do you have anything? Anything else to add? Any other topics you were no, thinking about? I, I appreciate the talk. You let me ramble and. Um, I went in directions I had not thought about. I would do it, but whatever. That's fine. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's perfect. I mean, that's what I love hearing from our guests, and that's why we do the show for sure. I will link to the Snyder Harris interview that you mentioned. I actually hadn't uh, seen that one, but yeah, definitely recommend again to our listeners. I mean, Timothy Snyder is probably the best, one of the best experts in the world on Ukraine and he all of his books talk about Poland, Ukraine, you know, bloodlands, the interwar and war periods of, uh, of Eastern Europe, I think very, very well. So I'd recommend that. Also, I will link to this paper I found, what I was talking about with Hoppe, and I can't even summarize it. Uh, I want to make sure I get it right, but it's, it's, on, it's called On Immigration Reply to Hoppe. It's by Anthony Gregory and Walter Block from fall 2007. Ah the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And my understanding is they're like full scale, no state at all, no, like no state intervention with immigration. Hoppe is not in a practical sense. But I, I, again, I, even saying Hoppe is not in a practical sense, maybe I'm getting it wrong because I know he's a very precise person and I wouldn't want to misquote, but uh, that's the paper if, someone, if people want to read it. But yeah, as far as Ukraine goes, um, certainly empathize with your support appreciate your libertarian views as always Stefan so definitely looking forward to getting the show out and hearing what people think so thanks a lot for joining thanks Matthew all right take care